For more than 25 years, a problem plagued theoretical and astrophysicists. Based on models of what occurs in the core of the sun, physicists determined it should produce a substantial number of electron neutrinos. Using data about its energy production, they calculated how many neutrinos the sun should produce and what neutrino flux should reach the Earth. Subsequently, several experiments were performed to measure the flux and verify the calculations. However, the early experiments found that only a fraction of the predicted flux appeared to reach Earth. This discrepancy became known as the solar neutrino problem. The problem was solved when one experiment appeared to confirm the suspicion that neutrinos produced by the sun change type or oscillate as they travel to Earth, making only a fraction of them visible to some detectors. However, inconsistencies between the measurements may hint at some other reason for the neutrino problem. Do solar neutrinos really oscillate between types? Or is something else causing the differences seen between the predictions and the measurements? This possibility will be explored to determine the real solar neutrino problem. The year is 1962. John F. Kennedy is president. John Glenn becomes the first American to orbit the Earth. And the Cuban Missile Crisis has the United States and the Soviet Union in a nuclear standoff. At the Brookhaven National Laboratory, radio chemist Ray Davis Jr. is facing a formidable adversary of his own. Davis is trying to detect the neutrinos coming from the sun, but the neutrinos are slippery subjects. So, he writes John Bacall, an astrophysicist at the California Institute of Technology, asking for help. Davis needs to know how many neutrinos the sun produces and how much energy those neutrinos possess. Neutrinos are extremely elusive subatomic particles that have nearly no mass and travel at near light speed. They barely interact with matter and supposedly billions upon billions of them from the sun pass through everything on Earth every second. Davis has been pursuing them for nearly a decade with no success. Though on the verge of giving up, he has been encouraged to keep trying. Several years into his career, in 1949, Davis became interested in detecting neutrinos. In 1952, he tried, unsuccessfully, to detect antineutrinos, the antiparticle of neutrinos, emanating from a fission reactor. To try to see them, Davis used a process conceived by nuclear physicist Bruno Pontecorvo in 1946 involving an isotope of chlorine. Pontecorvo proposed that, if a neutrino with enough energy interacted with a chlorine-37 nucleus, it would transform that nucleus into a radioactive argon-37 nucleus. Davis knew that fission reactors produced antineutrinos, not neutrinos, but at the time, it was not yet known whether antineutrinos and neutrinos reacted with nuclei in the same way. Davis's experiment using chlorine-37 with antineutrinos would be a test of this. Davis places a tank filled with 1,000 gallons of carbon tetrachloride, CCl4, outside the shield of the Brookhaven reactor. The flux of the reactor is thought to be nearly half a trillion antineutrinos per centimeter squared per second. Davis is hoping to detect some of them. After 36 days, Davis finds his detector has argon-37 in it. But once he analyzes the data, so much of the argon was probably produced by the high-energy protons from cosmic rays that he cannot tell whether any of it was made by the antineutrinos. 
Davis was not discouraged by the setback. He had read a paper published in 1938 by nuclear physicist Hans Bethe of Cornell University describing fusion processes that likely fuel the sun. These reactions are thought to produce a large neutrino flux that constantly showers the Earth. In light of this, Davis uses his 1,000-gallon tank of carbon tetrachloride to look for the solar neutrinos. He places the tank in a tunnel 19 feet underground to block out the cosmic rays. The bulk of the neutrinos from the sun are believed to have energies less than 0.42 MeV. However, the chlorine-37 reaction needs neutrinos with energy greater than 0.81 MeV, so it cannot see those neutrinos. Only a small fraction of the sun's neutrinos is thought to meet this threshold. From his results, Davis can only set an upper limit for the sun's neutrino flux, assuming all the neutrinos the sun produces have energies greater than 0.81 MeV. This is another miss. Still not discouraged, Davis runs his reactor experiment again in 1955 at the Savannah River plant in South Carolina. Using a reactor that produces a much higher antineutrino flux than the Brookhaven reactor, Davis still sees no sign of the antineutrinos in his results. However, at the same time, Frederick Rhinus and Clyde Cowan are seeing antineutrinos with their antineutrino detecting experiment at Savannah River. With this, Davis's chlorine 37 experiment strongly suggests that nuclei react differently to antineutrinos and neutrinos. The chlorine 37 can only see neutrinos. Davis needs a large source of neutrinos to test Pontecorvo's claim about the chlorine 37 reaction, but other than the sun, none seems available. Davis's search for neutrinos using chlorine 37 seems futile. But then, in 1958, a break. Maybe. Harry Holmgren and R.L. Johnson of the Naval Research Laboratory find that helium-3 and helium-4 fuse together to form beryllium-7 100 times faster than had been thought. This means the sun should be producing a significant number of neutrinos with energy of 0.86 MeV above the chlorine-37 reaction threshold. With this revelation, Davis's colleagues, William Fowler and Alastair Cameron, encourage him to continue looking for solar neutrinos with his chlorine-37 detector. Davis is aware of some work McCall has recently done and asks for his help in determining the beryllium-7 reaction rate in the sun and the neutrino flux it produces. McCall agrees to help Davis. Soon after accepting the task, Bacall realizes there are no solar models that calculate neutrino fluxes. So, he gets help from two stellar modeling experts at Caltech, Dick Sears and Iko Iben, and in 1963, they piece together a model for calculating the expected solar neutrino flux for Davis. The model uses beta series of nuclear fusion reactions believed taking place in the core of the sun to generate the neutrino fluxes produced at various energies. Beta proposed that, starting with two protons colliding and fusing together, a series of reactions that generate most of the sun's energy follow, including the one involving the formation of beryllium-7. These reactions ultimately convert the sun's hydrogen into helium, producing several neutrinos in the process. Using his model, Bacall calculates the fluxes from the beryllium-7 reaction and, much to his and Davis's dismay, finds they are too small for Davis's chlorine-37 detector to see. This appears, once again, to end Davis's quest to measure the solar neutrino flux, at least using chlorine-37. But, later that year, McCall realizes he has not properly determined the chlorine-37 capture rate 
for neutrinos produced by the boron-8 reaction, a branch off the beryllium-7 reaction in the sun. He corrects the calculation and the chlorine-37 neutrino capture rate for boron-8 neutrinos goes up by a factor of 20. This makes Davis's experiment seem doable again with a large enough tank. Armed with Bacall's calculations, Davis begins building a large experiment to detect the solar neutrinos in 1965. Davis's new detector tank holds 100,000 gallons of liquid. In order to shield the experiment from cosmic rays, Davis is allowed to build his detector 4,800 feet underground in the home state gold mine in South Dakota. Once completed, he fills his detector with 380,000 liters of the dry cleaning fluid perchloroethylene, C2Cl4, a chemical just as effective as carbon tetrachloride for detecting neutrinos, but less hazardous. Davis starts up the detector in 1967. He exposes the C2Cl4 to the neutrinos for periods of varying duration from about one month to over 200 days. When a neutrino reacts with a chlorine-37 nucleus, the argon-37 atom produced breaks free of the former C2Cl4 molecule and becomes a gas. At the end of each exposure period, Davis purges the radioactive argon-37 gas generated from the tank and counts the decays to determine how much argon-37 the neutrinos produced. And then, run number 18, from April 12th to November 14th, 1970, shows the first result of solar neutrinos detected by the experiment. The result shows that 30 atoms of argon-37 produced from solar neutrino interactions with chlorine-37 were collected after the tank was purged. The radioactive decay analysis determines the solar neutrino interactions with chlorine-37 in the detector produced argon-37 at an average rate of six atoms every 10 days during the run. After nearly 20 years, Davis has finally found his neutrinos. In subsequent runs, Davis collects more data, and by 1975, after more than 20 runs, he measures an average solar neutrino flux of 1.8 solar neutrino units, or SNU, where 1 SNU equals 10 to the minus 36 neutrinos per target atom per second. However, Bacall calculates the chlorine-37 detector should see a neutrino flux of 5.8 SNU. The detector is seeing only about one-third of the neutrinos the calculation predicts it would see. Over time, Bacall refines his model, but instead of falling, his flux prediction rises to 7.6 SNU. Davis also refines his experiment and improves his data analysis but, even after over 100 runs through 1994, he only gets his measured flux to increase to 2.56 SNU, still about one-third of the predicted flux. Given this outcome, Davis and Bacall are left wondering, is the calculation right and the measurement wrong? Is the measurement right and the calculation wrong? Or are they both wrong? These questions would haunt them for nearly 20 years before an answer is found.